In 1904, a sadistic killer preyed on women in the Cumminsville neighborhood of Cincinnati, killing three and assaulting a dozen others. He bludgeoned them, strangled them into unconsciousness, raped them, and then left them for dead. He became known as the Cumminsville Ripper, a case we covered in a prior episode. I would strongly recommend you give it a listen first, if you haven't already. Then, between 1906 and 1909, a killer preyed upon women in Dayton, Ohio, killing four and assaulting a number of others. As had been the case in the prior story, he bludgeoned them, strangled them into unconsciousness, raped them, and then left them for dead. In the course of one of these attacks, he also killed one male victim with a gun. He's today known as the Dayton Strangler, and in this podcast, we're going to try to piece together whether the Cumminsville Ripper and the Dayton Strangler could be one and the same. This is the story of the Dayton Strangler. Let's begin with a brief reminder. The place is Ohio, and the time is 1906. Very few homes had a phone. There was something like one phone for every 20 people at that time. And just as few had electricity. Communication with the authorities was slow, and so was the response. Cars were still a rarity, and city dwellers used the train to get around. Steam, diesel, and electric streetcars, sometimes called traction cars. Outhouses and water closets were still a thing, and nighttime travel was dangerous for a woman alone, especially in wild public places that were hard to light. It was one week until Thanksgiving. Rain had persisted for several days and turned Dayton into a cool, soggy Ohio moor on November 22, 1906. When a woman's body was discovered concealed in the weeds of a common on the west side of Groveland Avenue, near Grandview Avenue. The Dayton Herald made it front page news under the bold headline, Girl Murdered, Body Hid in Weeds. The murdered woman was identified as 20-year-old Donna Gilman, an employee of National Cash Register Company. The crime scene and condition of her body were described in detail. The further the investigation is conducted, the deeper the mystery becomes. It is the supposition of the officers and physicians that if she had been killed on the ground, her arms would have been at her side. But as it is, the right arm pointed upward, the elbow resting on the ground, while the hand was crooked, as though she had been resisting her assailant. It is also the supposition that the body was left upon the spot where the murder was committed, and then carried, after the body had become stiff, to the place where it was discovered. The killer murdered her somewhere else, then dumped her where she was found. But because rigor mortis had set in, her body was found in an odd position. The Herald wrote, Her clothes were wet, and it is thought that she had been laying in the rain of Wednesday, and probably of the night before. An umbrella borrowed from Ms. Ethel Collins of Forest Avenue, who also worked at NCR, and the pair of gloves supposed to have been worn by the murdered girl were found on the ground near the body. The umbrella and gloves are perfectly dry. The officials admit that if the umbrella had been wet, it could have been dried by the wind, but if the gloves had dried, they would have been stiff. When found, the gloves were soft. This condition is a puzzle to the officers. Two hat pins were found lying on the ground near the body. One was bent, indicating the possibility of the hat being torn from her head, and later placed upon her head as it was found this morning. A surface examination of the physical crime scene told a story about how the attack happened. From the evidence furnished by the territory surrounding the scene of the crime, the assault must have taken place on the west side of Groveland Avenue, where the street gave evidence of a struggle which was continued into the commons, where the weeds were crushed and disturbed. Naturally, investigators wanted to piece together Donna's last movements, according to the Dayton Herald. The last that was seen of the murdered girl was at 5.40 Tuesday evening. She rode home on a Went Fifth Street car with her cousin, Ruby Bond, of Grosvenor Avenue. Ms. Bond got off at Grosvenor, leaving Ms. Gilman on the car. The conductor of the car was a man named Tanzel, and efforts are being made to interview him to ascertain if anyone got off the car with Ms. Gilman, and if anyone was seen to join her as she alighted. 
The post-mortem examination confirmed the theory that the girl was choked to death. We did not uncover any further mention of Engineer Tanzel or information he may or may not have offered, so we're left to conclude it was of no use to the authorities. There was one immediate theory of note, though, right from the start of this murder investigation. The theory was advanced that the girl had been murdered by a jealous sweetheart, but this is believed to be incorrect. Ms. Gilman had a young man friend who lived in Cincinnati. He was not in this city Tuesday night when the murder is supposed to have been committed. Zany Gilman, the sister of the murdered girl, Tuesday night called up the forewoman in the department at the NCR company where Donna Gilman was employed. The forewoman suggested that the young man in Cincinnati be questioned, thinking possibly that there might have been an elopement. Acting upon the suggestion of the forewoman, the sister of the murdered girl called up the young man in Cincinnati and had no trouble in finding him. He said that he knew nothing of the whereabouts of the girl and had not seen her for several days. Donna Gilman's sister was looking for her, called her boss. Her supervisor said maybe they ran off to get married. The sister called the boyfriend in Sharonville and he said, no, I haven't seen her. Later in the story, the Herald revealed his identity. The name of the murdered girl's friend who lived at Sharonville, near Cincinnati, was Stanley Anderson. The police questioned Stanley Anderson and he was able to provide an acceptable alibi. You knew it wasn't going to be that easy. Notably, Donna Gilman's murder took place two years after the last confirmed Cumminsville Ripper case. The attacks on Mrs. Philip Gerbig outside of Spring Grove Cemetery on November 15th, 1904. I'm gonna save us all some time right here by pointing out that the murder of Donna Gilman would be an enduring mystery that occupied the press in Ohio for years, because there were plenty of supposed suspects and developments that did not amount to much. A local man that the newspapers referred to as a halfwit, David Curtis, was arrested and he promptly confessed. However, it soon became clear that he was an attention-seeking eccentric, and by December, he had been released. Public opinion was that the authorities had attempted to railroad him. Then, later on, Donna Gilman's family, including her mother and two of her siblings, were arrested for her murder and forced to post bond for some criminal theory that never materialized. It took until mid-1907 before the Gilman family was also cleared of any involvement in Donna's murder. There were other arrests and suspects as well. In the century plus since the murder of Donna Gilman, most agree that none of the suspects identified or arrested for her murder are the actual perpetrator. And we know that's the case because the killings continued. But before we get into that, let's pause to note just a few things already. Donna Gilman was last seen alive getting off of a streetcar in Dayton, Ohio, as she made her way home from work. She was walking alone along a common, a small wilderness-type area where a killer could conceal himself. She was apparently attacked from behind by a fiend who choked her, dragged her to a more secluded area, raped her, and then left her for dead. It was two blocks from the rail line. On the question of whether the Dayton Strangler is the same predator who was known as the Cumminsville Ripper in Cincinnati two years earlier, some of those details sound awfully familiar. As with the Cumminsville Ripper's murders of Mary McDonald and Alma Steinway, the Strangler was likely waiting in the darkness at the stop where Donna got off the car. The only thing missing from the Cumminsville Ripper's standard MO would be an obvious bludgeoning wound made with an unknown weapon. The unidentified murderer of Donna Gilman, who would later become known as the Dayton Strangler, was a disorganized, impulsive killer who brashly attacked in public, a sexual deviant who sometimes dragged his victims to another location and made it a habit of going for the victim's throat. To me, that sounds like the Cumminsville Ripper. Anna Markowitz and Abe Gordon, who went by the last name Cohen, were out walking on what was described in the local press as a lonely road near the National Soldier's home. It was August 4th, 1907. Anna's younger sister Bertha, who was 16 years old, had come along to keep them company. From out of the darkness, a man appeared. He swung a weapon sometimes described as a baton or a blackjack at Abe Cohen and struck him on the back of the head. Cohen turned to see who had attacked him, and the attacker pulled out a gun and shot him twice in the abdomen. Bertha later told investigators, as Abe Cohen fell to the ground, the attacker lunged for the sisters, and Bertha's feet took over. 
she ran screaming from the scene to the soldier's home to get help. When a posse returned, they found Abe Cohen still alive, but barely. Anna was missing. They followed the trail left by a struggle which led them through the brush to Anna Markowitz's body. From the Mansfield News Journal, the clothing had been nearly torn from the body. The arms were crowded down over the eyes as if to shut out a horrible picture. There was evidence of a fearful struggle and an assault. The girl was dead from strangulation. Abe Cohen succumbed to his injuries at the hospital and left Anna's younger sister Bertha Markowitz as the only eyewitness who had seen the strangler up close. Bertha described the assailant as perhaps 25 to 30 years old, tall, clean-shaven, and dressed in all dark clothing. Despite signs to the contrary, authorities initially suspected highway robbery as the motive for the crime. As with the case of Donna Gilman, when robbery no longer seemed likely, investigators focused their attention on the victim's family. The News Journal reported that Anna Markowitz's siblings were held under suspicion for a time because Anna's brothers did not like Abe dating their sister and often gave him a hard time about it, even admitting that they once followed him to Lakeside Park, but they denied all involvement in this crime. The murders of Abe Cohen and Anna Markowitz happened in quite literally the same location where Donna Gilman's body had been found, in the area of Dayton today known as McCabe Park. Like every neighborhood, it has changed a lot since the highway came through, but there are a surprising number of landmarks still around. A stone's throw away from McCabe Park is the Dayton VA which is what would have been commonly referred to as a soldier's home back then. But there's a landmark that's even more intriguing nearby, the Dayton National Cemetery, which is a very large cemetery. Today there's a divided highway to cross, but in 1906 it would have been literally two minutes walk from the spot where Abe Cohen, Anna Markowitz, and Donna Gilman were murdered. Even more intriguing, the tracks which passed two blocks north of the crime scene continued onto the grounds of the cemetery and that was the end of the line. The Cumminsville Ripper stalked women near Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. He was seen by train conductors just as they passed into the cemetery and again when they came out 18 minutes later. Is it a coincidence that the murders of Cohen, Markowitz, and Gilman also took place along a line where a rail car would go into a cemetery and come back out a few minutes later? If the Ripper and the murderer of Cohen, Markowitz, and Gilman are really the same person, could he have been an undertaker? Or was he simply a cunning psychopath who used the cover of the stone monuments in cemeteries to stage his killings? The nature of the nearby rail line also brings to mind several other questions. It was a remote, solitary spur from the main line, known as the Home Avenue Spur built primarily to serve the cemetery and National Soldiers Home operation beginning all the way back in 1867. It was the railroad equivalent of a dead end. If the Dayton Strangler, like the Cumminsville Ripper, used the trains and traction cars to stalk his prey and then quickly escape, what does it say that he struck along this dead end line? Again, the question, did he work for the railroad? And what were the procedures for train staff when they came into a stop like the National Soldiers Home? Did they get a break? How much time did they have before they had to be back on the car to head the other way? Authorities would eventually arrest and convict a black man named Leighton Hines for the murder of Donna Gilman, who later said he had been intimidated into confessing. Despite the conviction, the Dayton Strangler murders continued, and many more became convinced that authorities had convicted the wrong man. By 1909, even the local press was reporting that Leighton Hines was believed by most to be an innocent man. The last we heard about Leighton Hines was in 1917, when the Dayton Herald reported that he applied for relief from his life sentence with the Ohio State Board of Pardons. A search for the results of that hearing, using both his real name Leighton Marion and his alias Leighton Hines, turned up nothing. Although unsourced historical accounts claim that Leighton Hines was released, as of this recording we could find no record of it. So we know that he served at least 10 years of a life sentence for a crime he did not commit. At any rate, here again we have a murder with confessions and convictions, and yet the consensus seems to be that authorities never got the right person. The murder of Mary Forshner on January 24, 1909, was discovered after a search that came straight out of an episode of Scooby-Doo, and I don't say that with an air of whimsy either. Mary had been on an errand to deposit $9 in the bank, 
It was Saturday evening and she left home at about 6.15. Her parents expected her to return by 8.30. Robert Geppert was Mary's stepfather, the head of a large blended household of 11 kids. Five were his, four were his wife's, and they had two children together. So you can imagine the household was a beehive of activity, and it was sometimes a challenge to keep track of all of the kids. Gebert worked as a meat cutter at Christopher C. Summerlot's grocery and butcher shop at 600 Kiowee Street, today North Kiowee Street, and related the events of his day to investigators, as reported by the Dayton Herald. I left Summerlot's grocery, where I had been working all day, about half past eight Saturday night or a little later than that maybe, say quarter of nine. I went to Cornman's Barber Shop at Kiowee Street in the railroad. I had to wait a long time in there. I think I left about half past nine, and then I went to Hackworth's Saloon, corner Earl and Kiowee Street, where I had a glass of beer. I stayed there maybe ten minutes and came on home. It was not quite ten o'clock when I got home. The Gepperts thought that Mary would be home already, as stated by Robert Geppert. I think my wife said that Mary was out, that she had not yet come home, and we decided she had gone with Maggie, her sister, to a dance downtown, so I went to bed. It was after 12 o'clock when Maggie and her company got home, and when we found Mary was not with her, I got out of bed and went to look for her. I walked down to the car. I saw the light on the corner at the turn, and I thought there would be another car. No more cars came, and I went back to the house. Then Hire and Merkel came with me, and we started to look for her. We went through the vacant lot, the lot across from the Gebert home and between it and the Kennedy homestead. We found nothing there, and then one of the men climbed on top of the cement wall at Kennedy's. He could see nothing and got down. This was on the west wall. Then we went on Knox Street and started to look there. As a brief aside, it should be noted the particular neighborhood where Mary Forchner was murdered has changed extensively due to interchange construction over the years, and many landmarks are now gone. In our research, we have yet to find an exact address or intersection for the Kennedy estate, but we know it was near the Geppert home, and that's where they continued the search. Robert Geppert continued, the men were ahead of me when we passed the gate, and then the light from the lantern showed the hat. It was a hat from our home. I called the other men back, saying, here is her hat. The Springfield Daily News described what happened next. The father found a hat, a girl's hat. He looked. It was Mary's. Fearfully, he examined the ground. Parents do in Dayton when daughters are missing. Footprints of two persons were stamped in the soft mud. Covering the small footprints of a girl were broad marks of a heavy shoe. Keep in mind, this happened in a time when few had a phone and searches were conducted by lantern. As described by the Springfield Daily News, the broad footprints led across the ground. The little prints were there too, but unevenly placed as though the person that made them was off her feet part of the time. When a person is dragged by the hair, their feet are off the ground part of the time, especially if the dragged person is quite small and the dragger tall and strong. Today, this would have been enough for any of us to call the police and report what we had found, signs of a struggle and the girl's hat. In the early 1900s though, they would have likely had to have walked blocks just to find a phone. It was a different time. You didn't call anybody. You gathered your neighbors and followed the clues under the wavering yellow light of your lamp until you found your loved one. So, Robert Geppert jumped on the wall surrounding the Kennedy estate and spotted a patch of light-colored fabric. As he later described, I saw something white in the shed, beside the stable at Kennedy's, and we found it was my girl. As we discussed in the Cumminsville Ripper episode, murders in the early 1900s were presumed to be robbery-related by default. It was not yet common knowledge that some killers do it, not for money, but because they enjoy it. The press made a big deal about the $9 deposit that Mary Forchner had been carrying, and days later, Geppert would tell the Dayton Herald, Robbery was the motive of the crime. I am almost sure of that now, as the girl's ring was taken from her finger Saturday night. In 1909, people really didn't yet know about serial killers and how they sometimes keep mementos of their victims. According to the Dayton Herald, a post-mortem held later developed the fact that the girl had been assaulted, 
after having been struck repeatedly upon the head with a club or blunt instrument of some kind, and choked into unconsciousness. The motive was not robbery. Mary Forshner's bank deposit book was found nearby, the $9 still in it. She likely dropped it when she tried to fight off her attacker. If the killer had known what was in it, he might have stopped to take the money after committing the crime, but his goal was far sicker. The Dayton Strangler's attack on Mary Forstner also stands out as strongly similar to the means of attack that the Cumminsville Ripper used when he murdered Alma Steinway, hitting her on the head from behind on a public street, dragging her, kicking and screaming to a more secluded location, then strangling, raping, and leaving her for dead. In the ensuing investigation, several witnesses were believed to have seen the man who likely killed Mary Forshner. The first eyewitness was neighborhood resident Sam Morris. The Dayton Herald detailed his strange encounter. Sam Morris, who lives within a stone's throw of the spot where the crime was committed, is thought to have seen the man. Morris, according to a story, was standing at his gate awaiting the coming of his children, a boy and two girls, when he heard screams. He went towards the spot and saw a dark object lying in the field, at which he cast a handful of mud. Someone rose out of the darkness and a voice he didn't recognize said, You'd better get away from here or I'll fill you full of holes. Morris said he went into the house, got his shotgun, came out, and finding no one about, fired two shots into the air. Samuel Morris was held as a suspect initially, but later cleared. His role in the events of January 24th, 1909 is now considered that of an eyewitness who was likely present during, and within a few dozen feet of, the rape and murder of Mary Forshner as it occurred. Morris estimated the time to be approximately 9.20 p.m. The other eyewitness, identified as Mrs. John Sheff, claimed to have been chased by the man minutes earlier. I got off a car near my home at 10 minutes past 9, said Mrs. Sheff. I saw a man slinking in the darkness behind me after I had walked a little bit. I knew he hadn't been on the car and I walked faster. He did too. I ran. He ran and was gaining on me. I turned the corner to get to my house and the man stopped. A little dog ran out and then yelped. I think the man kicked him. In discussing the Cumminsville Ripper, I told you about Mrs. Wheeler's report of being stalked and followed shortly before Lulu Mueller's body was found two blocks away. In this case, the Dayton Strangler seemed to be exhibiting the same behavior. By January 26th, the local press reported that there was a third attack on Mrs. James Powers, who had to be rescued from the clutches of a man who assaulted her. As stated in one report, the citizens are in a frenzy of rage over the fact that these crimes have occurred in this city with a sickening frequency in the last few years, and there seems to be no indication of safety for women of Dayton, as another assault was attempted tonight on the person of Mrs. James Powers of West 3rd Street, who was rescued by her husband after her clothing had been torn and her throat bruised. The assailant escaped. A little later, the story offers more detail. Mrs. Powers, who was assaulted this evening, was standing in the door of her home when a man suddenly appeared and seized her. After a short struggle during which she screamed, her husband ran out of the house. Even after Powers' appearance, the assailant attempted to drag the woman after him and tore out a handful of her silk waist. That's three attacks on women, attempted murders, within 48 hours. Bold assaults right out in the open, even in the presence of men. When Mrs. Chef safely made it home just after 9pm, her stalker continued to hunt the same neighborhood and found Mary Forshner ten minutes later. They were targets of opportunity. The Dayton Strangler exactly mimics the M.O. of the Cumminsville Ripper, who terrorized Cincinnati in 1904. Elizabeth Fullhart was only 18 years old, but had been commuting from her home in Vandalia to Dayton on a regular basis to see her boyfriend. However, on January 29th, 1909, Lizzie, as she was known by acquaintances, went missing. Nobody heard from her for several days. Then, on February 5th, 1909, a development. As described by a local paper, the discovery today was made by Charles Weaver and his father, Fred, who had gone to a house at 124 North Jefferson Street to do some carpentering. 
The house has been vacant for some time, and the two men were sent to put it in shape for occupancy. Charles Weaver, on the way back to his work about two o'clock, went to the cistern to get a drink of water. The lid on the cistern refused to yield to hand pressure, and the young man got a crowbar and pried it off. As Weaver stooped to reach into the cistern with his water bucket, he noticed a bundle of clothing floating on top of the water, which was fringed with dirt and debris of varied description. He took hold of the clothes and pulled. The clothes were heavy, and when he tugged for some time, a pair of human feet emerged from the water. Weaver dropped his hold upon the clothing and called his father. The two men tried to drag the body from the cistern, but the water was so far from the mouth that they were compelled to fish out the bundle with a hoe. Just as with the previous episode, I'm pausing for a moment here to correct an inaccuracy. According to a number of sources and the Wikipedia entry for the Dayton Strangler, Elizabeth Fullhart's date of death is listed as sometime after February 7th. In truth, Lizzie had been missing since January 29th, 1909, and her body was discovered in the cistern on February 5th, reported in the papers on the 6th. The coroner estimated her body had been in the cistern for about a week. That fixes Elizabeth Fullhart's approximate date of death as January 29th, 1909, or perhaps the day after. That puts her death within 24 hours of arriving in Dayton. That would also mean that Elizabeth Fullhart's murder took place only about five days after the murder of Mary Forshner. There are a number of elements of the Elizabeth Fullhart murder that can make one question whether it is actually the work of the Dayton Strangler. The body was found wrapped in burlap and carefully hidden in a manner inconsistent with the careless way previous victims were discarded. It is, however, hard to deny a young female victim killed in Dayton in 1909 could be a victim of the Dayton Strangler, especially when the vacant house where Lizzie Fullhart's body was found is right in between the sites of the prior four murders, just three blocks from City Hall and in a part of Dayton described at the time as densely settled. Oh, yeah, and you could also catch a streetcar just a couple of blocks away. The public was weary of the Dayton Strangler by this time and was starting to keep a scorecard in the newspapers. For two and a half years, the authorities had failed to capture the predator who hunted women in Ohio. In the press coverage resulting from the murder of Lizzie Fullhart, the papers printed the names of Ohio citizens whose murders had not yet been solved. These include the same five names that we've attributed to the Dayton Strangler in this episode. Donna Gilman, Anna Markowitz, Abe Cohen, Mary Forshner, and Elizabeth Fullhart. All of those names were frequently mentioned in the press in relation to each other, considered part of the same case at the time. However, in the course of researching Elizabeth Fullhart's murder, we found another name not previously mentioned in any of the contemporaneous coverage of the Strangler's crimes. So before we ask some open-ended questions and draw our typical wild conclusions, let me tell you about a crime for which we have to turn the clock back nine years to the turn of the century. A terrible crime was committed in Dayton Saturday night. Those were the first words from the Dayton Herald on October 15, 1900. Mr. and Mrs. Charles F. Lance shared the same birthday. He was 53 and she was a decade younger. We must assume that they were a popular couple with plenty of space. Because that night, 15 other married couples showed up at their home at 48 Leroy Street unexpectedly to celebrate the event. A big surprise party. As the night wore on, the adults gathered for a game of euchre while the children, including their daughter Ava, 11 years old, played in the yard. Those who believe in the meaning of stars and planets, even with an ironic embrace, would point out that Neptune had just entered retrograde in October of 1900, as if in warning. Astrologers often say that Neptune works as a veil, easing our anxieties, but when it enters retrograde, our illusions can be shattered by harsh realities. In this case, the reality of merriment and joy at the Lance's joint birthday celebration was about to be smashed to pieces. Among the guests at the party was police officer Charles Brandon, his wife, and their daughter Lily. It was shortly after 10 p.m. that Lily went inside to report that she could not find Ada. The Herald detailed the search that followed. 
The mother went outside and called her, but received no answer. Mr. Lance and some friends then took a lantern and searched for the child. By this time, the Euchre game had broken up, and a certain degree of excitement began to manifest itself among the guests. The neighborhood was systematically searched, but no trace of the girl was found. Finally, one of the searchers, among whom was Mr. George Hotz of North William Street, suggested that the vault be examined on the thought that the child may have fallen into it. Lighted matches were dropped through one of the openings of the seat, and an object was discovered which resembled a child's shoe. This warranted the overturning of the building, and a more careful investigation was made. To confirm the now well-defined suspicion, a ladder was placed in the opening, and Mr. Lance's oldest son went down and grasped the shoe. Then he drew forth the body of his sister. The clothing was cut from the little form, which was soon thoroughly cleansed with water. The scene was beyond description. Accompanying the story was a sketch of the yard behind the Lance's home. It was three steps down from a quaint back porch to reach the path, which in turn descended into the yard where it made a right turn and continued to a door, which was the crime scene. The Dayton Herald wrote, A little innocent child, a girl of less than 12 years, was inhumanly choked into helplessness, then criminally ravished and finally thrown into a vault. The evidence shows that she was alive when her little body was thrust headfirst into the contents of the vault. Historical accounts have been kind in retelling the horrible events of Ada Lance's murder, because most of us, I think on first blush, don't understand what that horrible description means. The vault, where Ada Lance's lifeless 11-year-old body was found, is a very polite way of saying that she was found in the outhouse. The coroner later determined that she had been smashed in the face with some kind of weapon, strangled, and then raped before she was thrust into the vault. Ada Lance was not quite 12 years old. If she was a victim of the Dayton Strangler, she was the youngest among them. Her murder in 1900 also stands oddly alone in relation to the Strangler's other crimes between 1906 and 1909. On the other hand, Ada Lance's murder took place barely a mile from where Donna Gilman's body was discovered six years later, and not even two miles from where Elizabeth Fullhart's body was found three years after that and the Lance's home was just blocks from the same dead-end railroad spur to the National Soldier's home. It's hard to ignore the reputation of a shady neighborhood. At the time Ada Lance's name was published, it was simply one of a number of unsolved crimes, not necessarily characterized as having been the work of the Dayton Strangler. In the time since, however, there seems to be some belief that the Strangler was responsible for the murder of Ada Lance in 1900, if for no other reason than the neighborhood. We are inclined to think that Ada Lance's murder could be the work of the Strangler, but probably isn't. We do entertain wild fantasies that we could somehow get our hands on an accurate guest list of the Lance's celebration that night, although the chances are slim. If we could though, we would like to check for one name in particular, Alfred A. Knapp. Mr. Knapp lived in Cincinnati at the time of Ada Lance's murder, and rode the same rails through Hamilton, Dayton, and Indianapolis. Knapp was convicted of murdering his wife in Cincinnati, and then confessed to at least four other murders from Cincinnati to Indianapolis between 1894 and 1902. From Hamilton, Ohio, he got the nickname The Hamilton Strangler, and according to the Salem Daily Capital Journal, Knapp was believed responsible for many more murders and apparently said he had a habit of just pouncing on children at random and choking the life out of them. He went to prison in 1903 and was executed for the murder of his wife, so he could not be responsible for the Dayton Strangler or Cumminsville Ripper cases since they all happened in 1904 or later. However, he could be responsible for Ada Lance's murder in 1900. I wonder if the name Alfred A. Knapp was on the guest list at the Lance's surprise birthday party that night, or if Ada's murder is connected to any of the others. Many have pointed out the lack of a cohesive physical description of the suspect, which could bolster our case that the Cumminsville Ripper and the Dayton Strangler are the same killer. Our response to that would be that the descriptions of both the Ripper and the Strangler seem to be all over the place. At different times, they were described as a black man, a white man, biracial, a killer with a bushy mustache, a clean-shaven killer, one was tall, one was short. Is it possible that the eyewitness description of the attacker in the Abe Cohen and Anna Markowitz case, given by her sister Bertha Markowitz, just be an error 
Bertha described him as tall, but that is subjective. She was 16 years old at the time, and depending on how tall she was, she could think that someone that someone else described as short was rather tall. There weren't streetlights in these neighborhoods. There was very little lighting in public spaces. It was almost always dark, and the attacks were fast-moving, violent affairs. We seem to think that the physical descriptions of the suspect are largely unreliable. The killer's real defining characteristic seems to be his M.O. You can recognize his madness, but what about the gun? It is a glaring discrepancy that in only one instance, the attack on Cohen and Markowitz, the killer used a gun. In the murder of Mary Forshner, the killer seemed to threaten Samuel Morris with a gun, so perhaps he had one that just couldn't be seen on that occasion. One could also argue that he only ever used a weapon, or threatened to use one, when a man was present. He enjoyed dominating and overpowering women, but did not want the same struggle with a man, so he used a gun in that instance. There are also important questions to be answered about whether the killer might have been moving bodies around. The inexplicably dry gloves found near Donna Gilman's body suggested that they had been recently placed there, as if the crime scene had been staged. In addition, several neighborhood residents, including Donna's own family members, refused to believe that her body had lain in the awkward position where it was found for two days because she would have been plainly visible from their home. The slovenly disorganized killer in the slouch hat that came to be known as the Cumminsville Ripper stalked North Cincinnati in 1904, killed three women, and attacked about a dozen more, as we discussed in the prior episode. The Ripper's final attacks took place in November of that year, and exhibited a spiraling out-of-control brazenness about them, increasing in frequency and with growing recklessness. Perhaps the killer gambled too much and got caught breaking the law somehow. Maybe it was some kind of minor infraction. Perhaps he had ridden the train to a nearby town like Hamilton or Sharonville or Dayton, a place where a guy could get arrested for burglary or assault without ever rising to the attention of the Cincinnati authorities investigating the Ripper cases. Maybe the killer went to prison, a short sentence for whatever small crime he got caught for, and decided to do his time quietly because it was better than getting caught for the really bad shit that he had done. Two years later, after serving his time, he decided to start over in a new place, Dayton, Ohio, just 60 miles from his old territory in Cumminsville. In this theory, on November 20th, 1906, he killed Donna Gilman. Fresh out of prison and cleanly shaven, the Ripper again left his big handprints on young women's necks. Again, the predator hunted, this time in an all-new hunting ground, but using the tools familiar to him the railroads and streetcars and dark lonely parks and cemeteries. He also showed evidence of evolution. After Markowitz, Cohen, and Gilman were found in the same neighborhood, the killer seemed to move to another neighborhood to hunt his prey. He also seemed to use a gun for the first time, presumably to streamline his attacks and eliminate any threat to his real goal, rape and murder. He was becoming a more advanced killer and rapist. The unidentified bludgeoning weapon he sometimes used in his Cumminsville attacks was identified in the Markowitz and Cohen murders as a baton or a blackjack. If the killer brought a baton or a blackjack, which are both concealable weapons, it suggests forethought, planning, and an attempt to deceive. It was a weapon that could be concealed under a coat, on a streetcar, for example. It is our opinion that the Cumminsville Ripper and the Dayton Strangler are one and the same. We believe the same man is responsible for the murders of Mary McDonald, Lulu Mueller, and Alma Steinway in Cumminsville, all in 1904, then Donna Gilman in November of 1906, Anna Markowitz and Abe Cohen in August of 1907, and then Mary Forshner and Elizabeth Fullhart in January 1909, all in Dayton. We also believe that he could be responsible for the murder of 11-year-old Ada Lance in Dayton in 1900. However, we do not believe that he is responsible for the murders of Anna Lloyd or Mary Hackney in Cumminsville in 1909, for reasons that we discussed in the last episode. One other note, it can be really hard to research historical true crime when all the press used was a woman's husband's name. As you've heard in this episode, Mrs. John Sheff. Mrs. James Powers. Here's hoping that we never go back to that version of the patriarchy. Women are people too, with their own names and identities. In the process of researching this episode, we were again compelled, as with the Cumminsville Ripper episode, to create a Google map for all of the Dayton Strangler murders. 
You can find the link in the show notes below, and we would welcome any assistance from Armchair Sleuths. There are, of course, bigger theories and ideas to be considered about the Dayton Strangler and the Cumminsville Ripper. If the same man were responsible for the crimes that we have named here, there are a lot of gaps in the timeline to be filled in. Yes, it's possible that he was in prison for the almost exactly two years between Thanksgiving Week 1904 and Thanksgiving Week 1906, but it's also possible that he was just killing somewhere else during that time. There were 10 months between the murder of Donna Gilman and the murders of Markowitz and Cohen, 16 more months before he attacked and murdered Mary Forshner. What was he doing in those time periods, and where was he doing it? If he rode the rails as much as we suspect he did, or even worked for the railroad, we should be looking for victims in the gaps, from neighboring cities and states, where perhaps the killer's crimes could have escaped notice. We should also be looking for arrest around November of 1904, Cases in which a man who could also be the Cumminsville Ripper got arrested for a minor infraction and sentenced to about two years. Paroles from prison right before Thanksgiving of 1906 could use a look. Also, arrest or deaths anytime after late January 1909 that could explain why the killer apparently stopped. Every one of those things sounds easier than it is, because sadly they did not keep records in 1906 with the same tendency that we do today. It also occurs to us that if one wanted to do a really deep dive into the Ripper or Strangler cases, the most valuable tool in the box would be a railroad expert, who could not only offer up information about the railroads, but which streets had electric streetcar lines, where the waiting rooms were, and other vital information. Not a single murder among these we've discussed happened more than a half mile away from a streetcar line. It would be really valuable to know where people got on and off these lines, and where the crew bunked or spent their free time. It is our opinion that the Dayton Strangler is the same killer who terrorized Cumminsville, but the likelihood that it can ever be proven is slim at best. The killer's MO is undeniably identical in both cases. Perhaps there are concrete answers somewhere off in the distance. Maybe we'll get lucky tying up one of the loose ends that I've mentioned here. Or maybe you have one of your own. Good, please chase it down. Because until we get more answers, the identity of the Dayton Strangler, and whether he was also the Cumminsville Ripper, will remain unresolved. <laughs>